Drew Hutchison. You're tuned to Local Bias. We come to you from Greenfield Community Television at 393 Main Street in Greenfield, of all places. And we are seen in different towns in Western Massachusetts, including Hadley, where I am the director of Hadley Media. Welcome to the show. And Andrew Blaze, welcome to the show. Andrew, for those of you who haven't watched Local Bias in a number of years, used to be the host of the show, and, the, and you've been the director, um, and you've been away, but you recently reached out and asked to help out again, and I am thankful for that. Today, our guest failed to show, and so I <laughs> corralled you into the chair, right, and I'm just right. going to grill you and make you feel extremely uncomfortable, and you're going to have to just tell me everything that's going on. So, what's going on, Andrew? Oh, a lot. Um, well, you know, I... Um, joined um, a political organization in uh, Greenfield called FCCPR, Franklin County, continuing the uh, political revolution. Okay. And, um, you know, people are interested in all sorts of things, and I thought, well, you know, how can I contribute? And so I thought, well, what they need is a, um, a TV show. So I volunteered to produce um, a show for them. And did they say, that's a great idea? Uh, they, um, they, they, they bought me roses and uh, dinner and, and so on and so forth. Yeah, they did. They liked it a lot. Um, and so over the last month or so, I've been putting together a crew mm -hmm. and um, making plans, you know, for the intro and the closing and trying to find some um, music, um, if, you know, for those, those parts and um, have, putting, have been putting together a list of guests. And um, our first show... We're going to tape on the uh, the first, okay. And our guests will be um, Sheila Gilmore and uh, Don Alexander. Okay, I don't know either. The well, name is Don Alexander is familiar, but he's um, he was appointed to the school committee a while back, okay, and then ran the... ran to be elected to the school committee. And Sheila has just been elected to the town council from precinct six, I okay. believe, my okay. precinct. And um, so I'm excited. Um, I found a host, uh, Mary Malmros. Another person who I don't believe I know. Well, she will become famous under my, my uh, product that's where producership. You, under your producership, sure. Right, and my directorship. And because so Lord knows being on cable access is the fastest path to stardom there is. <laughs> that's exactly right. Um, so she knows she'll have a star in some sidewalk somewhere. And sure. Maybe I'll have... Um, the crescent moon or something and um, so I'm, I'm, I'm you know I'm excited about um, that role I, I've never been a producer before you have right so I spent a lot of time thinking you know how, how what would Drew do uh -huh. and, uh, <laughs> and, um, and I remembered a lot of things you know I, I remember you know I, I, I learned up the overall process while, while helping you put together right. local bias and um, it's you know it's a very exciting uh, thing to nice. do. It's an ex exciting thing to do to um, to be a producer. I mean you know it from your own experience, but um, I, I was uh, you know surprised at uh, at um, how much fun it was you know to pull together a camera crew and a sound person. Mm -hmm. And uh, originally I thought I would be the host. Right. And then I thought I, I kind of like this role as producer and director, oh, I, I want to do that. Right. And um, so um, I asked around um, <clears throat> and uh, I talked to uh, some people at FCCPR. Um, I don't know if I said what that means. It's Franklin County continuing Continue, the political right. revolution. And um, somebody said, oh, Mary Melrose, she'd be really good at that. So she and I met um, a few Sundays ago at uh, um, one of the coffee shops here in town. I'm not sure if I can say the name of it, but well, you can as long as Greenfield you're... Coffee. There you go. I fess up, and uh, you know what? What I thought was going to be, you know, a half-hour conversation turn. You know, we ended up closing the place. Right. And um, well, and if, you, if you recall, the kind of the conceit behind local bias originally had something to do with the conversations I used to have with you back before I even knew you. I mean. I would run into you in a coffee shop, and for whatever reason, we'd just start talking, and then we'd sit down and have coffee and have a conversation. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. what I thought about local bias was that, oh, well, there's a couple people sitting there having a conversation, and we just happen to have cameras. 
who are catching the conversation, and let's hope that it's an interesting one. Mm -hmm. And to that end, mm -hmm. I, I've always done my best to find who I think are interesting people, and I count you among them um, as, you know, as an interesting person. Uh, certainly, I've not figured you out yet. I know there's some like Freudian stuff going on there. But, oh, definitely. Uh, but uh, in fact, you studied Freud. That All was the your, time. I still am. You have a, a, a doctorate in Freudian psychology? No, or, or? my PhD is in philosophy, but um, after I finished my dissertation, um, I was interested in a number of questions, and, and um, one thing led to another, and next thing I know, I was reading about and reading Freud. And so are his insights into human nature and the human psyche still appropriate today, you think? It's a good question. Um, in, a, in a world where psychology has, um, or therapeutic psychology has become chemical, right? Um, a lot of people might think that... Because uh, it's more it, behavioralism now, in a way. They're more worried about how you're acting as opposed to what the intrinsic issue is. Right. There's a lot of, a, a, a lot of work is done towards changing behaviors. Um, you know, I, I've just been reading a, an interesting book um, by a guy named Bruce Fink, which is probably an unfortunate name to, to have as a, as a, a psychotherapist. But, um, but he, uh, he made an interesting observation. He said that uh, he was at the um, American Psychological Association at a meeting, and um, he was you know, sort of milling around, and he started asking, all these people um, who um, uh, worked in either research or as therapists, you know, um, what model does your, your, if you happen to be right. in therapy, what, what model does your therapist um, adopt? And um, he found out that people um, said that they look for Freudian. Really? Yeah, he said about six out of seven. I find that to be astonishing. I found it astonishing too, and it was an in in in, in um, what do you call that? An unscientific poll. But, sure, but still, uh, that's it, significant. It was it was an interesting uh, observation, um, and so um, I have a friend who is a uh, a therapist, and I asked him. I said, you know, what do you make of that? And he said, well, he says everybody knows that there's something deeper going on in us than just the chemicals. Right. And I don't, I, you know, when you, when you say deeper, you know, that opens up all sorts of avenues. You could be talking about the soul or a mind mm -hmm. or other things, things that aren't, you know, exactly scientifically respectable, but other things that, um, you know, that we've been clinging to for quite a long time. Well, know? I mean, we all have an identification of who we think we are. Mm -hmm. And we kind of hold to that idea but that itself is a facsimile because there's so many layers to all of us. And so one thing that I like about the Freudian method or transactional analysis is that it's not looking for a quick fix. It's allowing you to peel back the layers bit by bit. And that way you can get a deeper understanding as if, if you're actually open to the truth of what is there. Mm -hmm. And I think what we, we have in our society is that people typically want a quick fix. They want the easy answer. And if it doesn't fit in with their pre preconceived notions, they're likely to dismiss it regardless of the evidence because that affects their sense of self or their self-identity. And to challenge that is almost like a, a death. It's like an existential threat to them. You know, it's interesting um, when you talk about evidence that you know, brings to mind you know, the whole question of the scientific status of psychoanalysis. Mm -hmm. And you know, I, I, I've thought about that an awful lot over the years. and. Um, I've oftentimes read or reread different works by Freud and have like highlighted all the places where the word science shows up and and then you know tried to figure out what exactly is his relationship to science overall from right. these passages and um, so for example in the interpretation of dreams which was his really his first major work his first chapter is called uh, the scientific literature Okay. Um, on dreams, but when you read it, very little of it seems like science. Um, it, it's um, a lot of anecdote. Was well, this stuff like Anton Mesmer hypnotizing people and then what people say in that state? Or, well, I mean, it's, what's um, the where's the evidence coming from? The, the, the chapter, I didn't know there was going to be an exam. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the chapter is, is divided into uh, several subsections. 
and um, they're, they're, um, they're labeled things like um, the role of memory in dreams. Mm -hmm. And so, for example, he says, you know, it's really astounding the things that people have found um, that they've remembered in dreams. Um, so um, the, the, there's an example he gives um, where someone, and, and it's, it's often the case, you don't know whether Freud is talking about himself or not, right? He says, you know, well, there's a famous case, you know, and then you think, well, it's, he doesn't exactly name it, and you think, oh, well, maybe he's talking about himself. And a lot of the literature on Freud is, you know, is this Freud talking about himself, or is this about some guy he met at a conference in, you know, 1887 or something? And, uh, but he talks about this, this guy who had a dream, and uh, in the dream, there was a, um, a picture of a plant. And in the dream, he remembered, or he thought he remembered the name of the plant. And it turns out that um, he didn't get the name exactly right. Um, but um, he, uh, he, it turned out there was really such a plant. And he couldn't, for the life of him. Where would that come from? Where did it come from? And like, Literally more than a dozen years later, he was um, he was having coffee with his sister-in-law, and on their table was a book that um, I think it was his brother had given to the sister-in-law and the husband as a wedding um, present, mm -hmm. and he opened it up, and they were the pi these pictures of all these these plants, and. Um, the names of the plants were written in ink underneath, and he looked at it, and it was his handwriting. And one of the plants was the plant that was in the dream, and he had totally forgotten about it. Right. And it turned out that when his one of the relatives was producing this book to be the wedding present, they said, oh, you know, um, I can't remember the guy's name, um, you know, Gunta. Would you would you write down the names? And he said, no, oh, this is a dull thing to do. And right. apparently he did it and he, he, he did that. But, you know, when you when you think about, um, you know, what is scientific right. in that? Well, the thing is, with the scientific method purports that you measure something and it's replicable. Well, how do you measure a dream and how is that replicable? That's a good question. That's a good question. Well, anyhow, one of the things that um, I, I've, been, I've been led to think about was um, the, uh, um, whether psychoanalysis is a science. Because everybody, you know, you tell people, you know, you're interested in psychoanalysis, and the, one of the first things you hear um, is, oh, hasn't that been refuted? Right. It's, it's, it's fallen of, maybe out of fashion, but I don't know that it's ever been refuted. Well, maybe not out of fashion if Fink's observations are, are, are right. Um, but um, uh, one of the things that I've been thinking about for a number of years is, is if maybe it isn't science. And maybe, and maybe Freud um, was, uh, was really conflicted, mm -hmm. which I, I, I totally identify. I'm, I, I'm you know, one of my my deeply rooted personality traits is ambivalence. Mm -hmm. Or maybe not. But uh, the, how do you feel about that? <laughs> I'm not sure. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so I think he was really ambivalent about whether he wanted to be a scientist or whether he wanted to be something else. And if he wanted to be something else, what exactly was that? Well, maybe he wanted to be treated seriously the way science was treated. Well, um, you know, it's interesting, at different periods of his life, I think maybe that was true, mm -hmm. like when he was a young man. Right. Um, and I mean, like, Because he was uh, at the forefront of his field, which meant that his field didn't exist, which meant that it wasn't yeah. held in the same esteem as something that's been around a little bit longer. Well, I, I think, I, th I, th I think, and then this brings me to kind of like what I think that other thing is. But one of the things Freud found himself doing was talking to really, really seriously troubled people. Right. And I don't mean treating them, Right, because he tried electric shop, mm -hmm. shock, right? Um, electric, which shock. apparently does work on some people. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I, I don't mean like this, you know, putting the electrodes, oh. sort of like you know, let's let's just jolt. You're talking Drew. about a, putting someone in a bathtub with an electric toaster. Well, not maybe a toaster, but some, <laughs> some you know, nine volt battery okay. or something, like, or something in between. And um, and then there was um, you know uh, hydrotherapy, giving people nice warm baths and things like that. And he tried all that. And he tried hypnosis, but then he found himself um, talking to them, 
And uh, he started seeing that there were these ways of talking to people. So I think, I think that you know, one of the, the things that, um, that leads you to, and that other thing that maybe what psychoanalysis is, it's just somehow conversational, mm -hmm. or, or maybe a form of behavior which you might describe as ethical. Okay, so you're listening without judgment. You're allowing the person to unburden themselves of things that they maybe feel in society they can't share. It could, it's something like so that. So that's yeah. a kind of, and through the, through the development of trust, of course there's transference you have to worry about. I mean, there's projection, I mean, all that yeah, stuff yeah. can happen. But he had to find all this out in the process of inventing this field, basically. Yes, yes. But who went to see him? People that generally had money because they didn't have insurance. It wasn't like, oh, you know, the, you know Blue Cross Blue Shield to cover you when you go see Sigmund Freud. You know, that's interesting about the, um, the nature of his patients. Uh, a lot of women? You know, a lot of people th sort of just... have this picture of the sort of the, the, the paradigmatic Freudian client. Right, as a, hysterical. As, a, as a, you know, a, a wealthy white woman, a woman and a wealthy white men who, um, you know, had money to, you know, sort of lavish. Indulge money. in this. Right. But what's interesting is that Freud and um, nearly all the founders of the original, you know, um, school of psychoanalysis were really um, um, deep and profound believers in um, free public clinics. Okay. So um, there's a book by... Um, so they worked pro bono a lot then? Yes. Okay. And it, it would not be unusual for Freud to work from early in the morning to early in the afternoon and then um, leave his home and go to the hospital and, and, and work in the free clinics, the poly clinics is what they were called. And um, a woman named, I can't remember her first name, but her last name was Danto. Her father was, uh, I think he wrote the art column for the, the nation for a long time. His okay. name was, uh, I can't remember his first name either. Um, but um, they, um, she wrote a, um, a really interesting book called Freud's Free Clinics, in which she, dis you know, she talks about what Freud's day was like and how he was involved with all, you know, the, these these um, relatively, um, you know, impoverished people who were suffering, um, you know, from uh, all sorts of things. Uh, not the least of uh, which was the fact that they, you know, they worked in really brutal environments mm -hmm. that were traumatizing in a lot of ways. And um, so, you know, who are Freud's patients? Um, well, you know, one of the things that Freud tried to do is he tried to keep his cards in his, the privacy of his, 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 his clients close to his chest. Okay. Um, it's, you know, it's interesting, another thing that you hear an awful lot uh, about Freud is that he based all his theories upon a half a dozen or a dozen clients. That's not, that's not true. Um, what's true is that of all the clients he had, he only wrote about about a dozen of them. Okay. Um, you know, there are the famous case histories. There's, um, uh, they all have really interesting nicknames. There's the Rat Man, um, which I've just been reading the, the case of the, the Rat Man again. Um, um, and from the perspective of um, how did he talk to this guy? The seriously disturbed guy who uh, was haunted by these obsessive thoughts, and um, it, it's it's kind of interesting that you know um, uh, it um, it wasn't confessional mm -hmm. and it wasn't medicine, mm -hmm. it wasn't ethics, but it was somehow very similar to all of those. Now, did he? What I, mean, the, the, I always have the image of: there's this chase lounge, the. The client yes. is yeah, yeah. sitting there, and then Freud is kind of out of view a little bit, to this, maybe a little bit back or to the side. Just, and how do you feel about that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and then they just keep going on. So, yeah, the, yeah. so the ex exchange is typically more one way. It's not a bona fide yeah. conversation that's equal. It's really, he's just fine, trying to elicit all the information he can out of this person, and they're kind yeah. of just speaking extemporaneously at times. You know, it's, it, free association is the fundamental rule, supposedly. It's interesting in The Rat Man, one of the things he says that really took me aback in that, you know how you, you sometimes read things and you go, oh yeah, that happened, and then it doesn't really sink in as somehow important. But one of the things he says, it, um, um, he says that, um, and we don't know the guy's name, right? Okay. Because it was confidential. Um, a lot of scholars think they've identified, you know, this poor fellow, but 
be that as it may, right? He said, this fellow was so upset, he, he, he got up off the, 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 the couch and started walking around the room. And Freud said, you know, um, I got up and we walked around the room and talked about the works of art that were in, in, his, in his office. And he said, this, this relaxed him. And finally, we got back to the thing that had so agitated him. But what was interesting is that, you know, the, the classical view is you lie on the couch, your head is here, the, the analyst is sitting behind you, you can't see the analyst. Right. But, you know, even in his practice, right, the practice of psychoanalysis, Freud didn't always adhere to that. Right. And he was kind of... He wasn't trying to force everything to his will. He was, he was just looking to elicit... The information that Tell me him. what's on your mind right, to wit, free associate. And, right. uh, you know, there's something strangely moral about that. Right. And, and, and it's not moral in the sense of, um, you know, um, this is wrong. Or, you know, um, you know, does this produce the greatest amount of good for the greatest number? Right. Or does this satisfy the categorical imperative or something like that? Or is, you know, is this in, in harmony with the Ten Commandments? It was moral in the sense that um, morality involves a, uh, a, a, a dialogue amongst people in, um, in, 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 in making decisions about how they're going to live. A respect for human dignity. Yes, yes, yeah. So anyhow, that, um, that, that, um, that's a lot of what I've been thinking about, about the good old Sig. Um, so what would Sig have to say about Donald J. Trump, you think? Oh, that's a good question. Um, because I've read in columns where different psychi psychologists and psychiatrists yes, have said, oh, yes. we, sh we shan't say anything because it's not our place. And then others say, well, I feel compelled to point out that he's a narcissist, as if we couldn't tell that on our own. <laughs> yes, um, right. <laughs> but when, and then the, the ethics of actually diagnosing somebody without them being your actual patient. And then the, the ethic. So there's all these gray areas. And he is all of our president. So don't we want to know if he's actually a stable genius or not? Well, you know, um, see, on the one hand, I feel like I should say I, 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 I believe down to the core of my being that, you know, Trump is a despicable human being and so on and so forth. On the other hand, ambivalence, mm -hmm. right? um, I, I, you know, I, I kind of wonder, you know, uh, um, well, you want to know his relationship with his dad? Who no, well, no, I, no. I, you know, I, I wonder what it would be like, you say, you know, to have him for an hour a week and say, talk to me. Right. Right? Don't bullshit me. Right. Just let it go and talk. Um, it might be really frightening. And, you know, I mean, can you imagine doing that with Hitler? Right. I mean, that's the famous example, you know. Sure. Um, one time I was, I was wheeling across campus and I was behind these two undergraduates and one undergraduate says to the other, he says, oh, you didn't make it to class. He says, oh, I was so hungover I couldn't make it to class. He said, what did we talk about? He said, you know, we talked about World War, World War II or something like that. And this, and somebody brought up Hitler and the, 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 the hungover student says, yeah, you can always bring up Hitler. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, it's like, you know, if he didn't exist, we'd almost have to make him up, you know. Right. But, you know, there's a guy, you know, you wonder, I wonder sometimes, you know, what, what, would he like, what would he be like just hearing the depths? You know, maybe it would just be such vile garbage, right. so disgusting trash that you couldn't stand it. Right. right. You'd say, you know. Well, he seems to be a pathological liar. And that, who, Trump? Trump. Yeah, yeah. And, and because he'll repeat a lie and that lie will have been proven to be wrong. And he doesn't accept that it's been proven wrong. He'll just go out and say it again, mm -hmm. almost thinking that, well, if I keep saying it, people are going to believe it, and that makes it true. And I think on a certain level, he thinks that because he says it, that makes it so. I, I'm, I mean, I, there's some kind of pathology there that I, I have the hardest time understanding. Well, you know, there's, there's the, the kind of an urge to, you know, say, well, maybe he's just a dopey old guy, and, he, you know, he, he shouldn't be there for that. But you know, that's a rather dismissive attitude, yes. even though it's sort of true. He accomplished true. something. He found a way to find himself in the White House. 
Well, you know, remember that movie Being There? Yes, Chauncey Gardner. You know, Chauncey uh, ended up in the, uh, in the White House in, in it's <laughs> almost in the same way, you right, know. Right, um, Who was that? That was... Peter uh, Sellers. No, no, who oh. wrote the book? I don't know. It, um... Yeah, you do. Um, Tom, Thomas Berger? No. Uh, um... <laughs> It'll come to me. Well, we don't uh, want to have too much dead air, so let's keep well, we can, we can we can filter it out. Oh. We can edit it out, right? We can edit it out. Well, if we have to, I try not to do that. Okay. Anyhow, he wrote the, he wrote the Painted Bird. Um, Jersey Kaczynski. Oh, there you go. Right. Um, wrote um, Being There. Okay. Right. Which is, you know, Jersey Kaczynski. Is, is, I don't know if you've read much Jersey Kaczynski. Oh, he's, he's an interesting writer. Um, he's, uh, you know, he's got this really interesting formula, and he applies it to the becoming president, right. you know, in that, in that book. Um, uh was he brilliant? Was it was it a conscious act, or was it just an accident? You know, it it it's it's. Well, it uh, does seem the pendulum swings different ways at different times, and the right person almost seems. It's almost as if there's macro forces that create a reality where somebody of that type. So yeah. whether it's him, uh -huh. somebody of that type, ends up in that position. Right. And yeah. a lot of it is because. There was a, a hatred of, a, of Barack Obama. Yeah. Um, yeah. His legitimacy was questioned by Trump himself for years. Yeah. And even though they proved it, it's still, oh, those are fake documents. Yeah. Or, uh, it just this is it, and, and, and it's like, well, is it because Barack's a black man? Um, or people that think he, he's a, Islam, he's you know Islamic. His middle name was Hussein. I mean, it's just the right. the amount of disinformation and the the way that people hold on to their feelings about about him. I mean, mm -hmm. a lot of my conservative friends was like, oh, thank God, now we got somebody in the White House that people can look up to and make America great again. And those of us who don't share that view look at who we have in there now and say, well, if Obama had ever tweeted one tweet like Trump there would have been a massive outrage. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's almost as if Trump can get away with anything, Obama couldn't get away with anything. Mm -hmm. And I think we are coming to the end of our show. And okay, there you go. So thank you very much, our camera operator and producer. We didn't get a chance to return to FCCPR. Oh, so quickly, we have, we have another 20 seconds. Okay. So you're gonna start a new show. They're right. Democracy here, and it's going to be on GCTV. It will be. If you get me a copy of it, I will air it on G on uh, Hadley Media. That's very that's wunderbar. And if anyone wants to get in touch with you, Andrew, should they just chase you down on the street or? Uh, Andrew dot blaze at gmail dot com. All right, you got that. B l a i s. B l a i s, and I'll put that up there. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm Drew Hutchison. You've been tuned to Local Bias. You can watch us at gctv.org at your convenience. You can also go to hadleymedia.org, and I will be posting that there as well on our website. So until next time, take care.